This episode is brought to you by Shopify. Looking to start a side hustle or become your own boss? Do it with Shopify. Whether you're selling succulents or stilettos, Shopify has the industry-leading tools to help you create, control, and grow your own business. So get serious about selling and get Shopify today. Sign up for a £1 per month trial period at shopify.co.uk slash specialoffer, all lowercase. That's shopify.co.uk slash specialoffer. Hello and welcome to Audiobook Connection, behind the scenes with the creative teams. I'm Becky Parker Geist and I'm your host. Audiobook Connection is your place to learn about the audiobook creative process in discussions between the authors, narrators, producers, and post production teams that bring them all together, as well as guests who have listened to the audiobooks and have questions for the creative teams. This podcast is sponsored by Pro Audio Voices, helping great stories come alive through audiobook production and marketing. And today I am here with Claudia Marseille, author of But You Look So Normal, Lost and Found in a Hearing World. Claudia, welcome. Thank you so much for having me. My pleasure. I love hearing origin stories, so I would love to hear what led you to write your memoir in the first place at this point in your life. Well, I was at an age where I was kind of reflecting back on the arc of my life as to different things that have really shaped who I am. And one of them, which is very major, is the fact that I was born with a severe to profound hearing loss and had to grow up with that and also seen through the different changes in technology over my life with a very primitive hearing aid to now. But what was the final push was I have a lot of women who are now at the age where they're getting a hearing aid for mild age-related hearing loss. And they say to me, oh, now I know what it was like for you growing up. And as sympathetic as I am to anyone dealing with hearing aids and technology and all of that, I know they really don't have any idea what it was like with a very severe loss from birth and a whole life that has been affected by that. So that really started me on the writing process. Yeah. It's so different when we've lived our our we've grown up being able to hear everything that's going on and developing those relationships and and I know that's one of the the things that you cover a lot in your in your book is how those relationships were changed because you couldn't participate fully in the way that someone who can hear everything that's going on can participate. Yes. And, you know, we are a social species and yeah. our survival is really at stake being connected to the so- social world. And we need that that social contact. And that was the, the hardest part for me was just being able to fit in with my peers, be able to participate, well, uh, not participate in so much of what was going on. I couldn't understand on the TV. I couldn't understand the transistor radios that everybody was listening to in the cafeterias during lunchtime when that's the time of real socialization. The cafeterias were extremely noisy. I couldn't understand a word that was going on. Slumber parties were really painful because people turned off the light and they would whisper in the dark and I couldn't lip read. I was very dependent on on lip reading. Classroom discussion, I could understand the teacher because I would sit in the front row and I could follow them more or less. And in elementary school, the teachers knew, not from, not in my uh, middle school or high school. But once it turned into class discussions and you turned to see who was talking, by the time somebody else started talking, I couldn't, you know, couldn't locate where they were. So there's a level of both sociability and information subterranean wise that I was not able to participate in. Right, right. And also, you know, for the your friends who, you know, regardless of how uh, of those who knew. So there's a couple different layers that you talk about in the in your memoir about, first of all, wanting to fit in and not be calling out the fact that you have this hearing loss. So there's a little bit of of that hiding it. And then even when you had friends that that knew that you had a hearing loss, expecting them to be able to remember all the time that you needed help 
in terms of being able to understand what was going on, what the rules of the game were, you know, so many things that we just generally take for granted. Yes. And I, you know, in elementary school, my mother told the teacher I was hard of hearing and I needed to sit in the front row. So the teachers knew, and it was very obvious to my classmates that I had a hearing aid because the the cord from the box that was clipped to my undershirt went to my ear and it was very obvious. When I started middle school, I got my hair cut short like it is now. And I finally got the first behind the ear hearing aids that were powerful enough for me. So I went to a large middle school and high school in Berkeley, and nobody knew, and the teachers didn't know. And my parents, because of stresses in their own life, simply did not advocate for me the way they should have. So I was kind of thrown to the wilds of of middle school. And, you know, this was a bad strategy, but I hid my hearing loss, and that that was not helpful. And that's very different from how kids are taught now to advocate for themselves, and parents are much more proactive. So that was a source of of, uh, shame and humiliation. There was a little bit of a stigma of hearing loss. You might be a little slow. Yeah, a a lot less understanding of what many different kinds of disabilities that they're in somehow, yes, this whole stigma of, oh, you have some kind of hearing loss or vision loss or, you know, something that then because of people's lack of understanding and that this information as we're growing up, you know, people just didn't understand that enough about it, about any of these. So there was a this stigma attached to uh, having some kind of, you know, physical disability, that somehow it meant something more. It meant that there was something wrong with you when it's really not that, right? There's just... No, and I think things really changed much later in my life. In 1990, when the Americans Disabilities Act was passed, and in 1994, the California's Deaf Children's Rights Act was passed. And that required, to some degree, reasonable accommodation on the job and in the classroom. And that began a slow shift in the culture at large of more acceptance of disabilities. You know, there were the wheelchair ramps that were built, so that was, you know, that was obvious. And, you know, the uh, sign language interpreters and closed captioning and writing on a board so that the information that was projected on the front of the classroom, things are really different now from when I was growing up. Yeah, thankfully. Thankfully yeah. for all and the so kids that, that, that are... has really uh, added to a, a gradual acceptance and understanding of people with differences. Yeah, yeah. And in writing your memoir, what was that writing process like for you? Well, you know, I came to writing later in life. I'm actually a painter. And, you know, as I said, I was kind of motivated to sort of uh, jot down some memories and some vignettes. And it came out in the form of poetry. I had a friend who was a poet, who, and I would get together with him, and he would read them. And he was very encouraging and said, write more. Then I joined a writing class and, you know, learned more about the craft of writing and dialogue and scene and and they at one point said, you know, you have enough material here for a full-blown memoir, which had not originally occurred to me. Ah, uh, interesting. The writing process was both painful and cathartic. Painful in that it really meant mining old material that I had kind of laid to rest and now was in my face and I had to really dig deep to see which, which of all my memories, of which there are lots, makes sense to put in the book but also cathartic to just get it out there and to finally tell my story. And now I'm at the uh, point where I'm having to start speaking my story. And that that's a big process for me, I have to say. Yeah, yeah. So when you were growing up, when you were living through your childhood, did you keep any journals or anything? Did you have any journal kind of diaries that you were able to reference back to? No. You know, I I had 10 years of lip reading and speech therapy, so my vocabulary, was, my speaking vocabulary was really behind that of my peers. My reading vocabulary was very good. I became a reader at a very young age, and that was important to me. 
And I learned a lot about the world through reading, how people thought about things, and just it just opened up so much for me. But no, I didn't I didn't keep a journal. I kept journals later in life, but not so much about my hearing hearing loss. And I think when I was younger, it was just too much painful territory. I didn't even want to go there. Um, right. Yeah. Right. When we're kids, we have no idea that later in life we're going to want to come back and remember what was happening. <laughs> no, but I do have a very good memory. So that, you know, I didn't need a journal. I do remember so much. I, the real problem for me was editing out uh, memories and trying to be more succinct. Yeah, oh, that's great. And this, uh, I think your book is just really a wonderful resource for people who are either have a hearing loss or have grown up with one as you have, or maybe have family or friends that might be suffering from hearing loss. What would you like the folks that think they might, or they might know someone who that they love that might be suffering from hearing loss? What would you like them to know? Well, I think I'm hoping that this book will alert people to if they themselves think they might be suffering from hearing loss or if they have loved ones who have suffering uh, from hearing loss, really to encourage them to have their hearing checked out and if they need hearing aids, to wear them. It makes a huge, huge difference. There is a, a study by Lancet that shows that regular wearing of hearing aids, you know, 16 hours a day, can offset loneliness depression, and even dementia. And that really makes a lot of sense to me. I can't tell you how many friends I have who, you know, have mild hearing aid, but still are struggling with it. Don't wear them. They have them in their pocket. They lose them. To me, it's mind-blowing that you would lose your hearing aid, but people do lose them. And there's a resistance to wearing them. And I understand it. It takes a lot. It does take some getting used to. It's a bigger deal than the eyeglasses. But so two things I want people to take away from this is one is the importance of hearing aid. Digital hearing aid is a total game changer from what I had. And they're so sophisticated and it can make a huge difference in a person's life. And then the other thing, takeaway, well, and then there's also a lot of assisted uh, listening devices, Bluetooth connectivity to the phone, which can make using the phone so much easier for people. Closed captions that makes a huge difference. And then there are different assisted listening devices that can be connected to your hearing aids that can make it easier for you to hear in noisy situations. So there's a lot out there that people can really avail themselves of. And then the other thing is I would love for people to have a sort of an insight glimpse into what a life uh, with severe hearing loss is like and to, you know, promote understanding and compassion for people with hearing loss and other differences. Yes, yes, absolutely. I think it's a magnificent book in that regard also. Tell me a little bit about the title, But You Look So Normal. I came across this title when I remembered back into 12th grade when I started coming out more with people that I had a hearing loss. And I was in an English class that was actually quite painful because it was uh, doing Shakespeare plays and he would play LP records, which is what they had in those days, listening to plays of Hamlet, Macbeth, and Othello. And he was British, had a very thick accent, a mustache over his mouth. I could not understand him in the class. And he wanted us to sit and close our eyes and listen to the language of this uh, of these plays, which is a great idea, but I was absolutely, totally lost. I needed to follow the text. And so I was desperate and thinking this would really affect my grade, and it was just very painful. So after class one day, I finally plucked up my courage and went to him and said, you know, I really have a hearing loss. I cannot understand the record with my eyes closed. I need to read the text. Would that be okay? And he looked up at me and said, oh, <laughs> but you look so normal. And I remember thinking, uh, you know, what does he think that a person with a hearing loss would look like? And I've gotten that from other people over the years. You know, they uh, when I come out and tell them, oh, you look so normal. I, and sometimes people would think that I was stunned when I didn't, in, when I was in college and people 
would ask me a question and I couldn't hear and I didn't quite respond. <laughs> I guess it all depends and on so, what well, culture we're in we the were midst dumb. of as to what people will, <laughs> yeah, the assumptions people will make. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That is true. Let's just take a short pause and we'll come right back. But You Look So Normal, Lost and Found in a Hearing World by Claudia Marseille is now available on Amplify Audiobooks. By age four, Claudia Marseille had hardly uttered a word. When her parents finally had her hearing tested and learned she had a severe hearing loss, they chose to mainstream her, hoping this would offer her the most normal childhood possible. With the help of a primitive hearing aid, Claudia worked hard to learn to hear, lip read and speak even as she tried to hide her disability in order to fit in as a result she was often misunderstood lonely and isolated fitting into neither the hearing world nor the deaf culture this memoir explores claudia's relationships with her own identity and herself as well as with her german refugee parents a disturbed psychoanalyst father obsessed over various harebrained projects and money-making schemes and a Jewish mother who had survived the Holocaust in Munich. Claudia shares how she emerged from loneliness and social isolation, explored her Jewish identity, struggled to find a career compatible with hearing loss, and eventually opened herself to a life of creativity and love. But You Look So Normal is the inspiring story of a life affected by, but not defined by, an invisible disability. It's a journey through family, loss, shame, identity, love, and healing, as Claudia finally, joyfully, finds her place in the world. Narrated by Becky Parker, that's me. Get your copy of the audiobook, But You Look So Normal, today at AmplifyAudiobooks.com. And we're back. So, Claudia, tell us a little bit about what your aspiration is in, you know, with your project moving forward. What's next for you? You mentioned speaking, so I'd love to hear a little bit more about what's going on there. And yeah, what else? Well, a couple of things about speaking. In fifth grade, I bombed my oral report on Abraham Lincoln, and I stood on the stage frozen, humiliated, and speechless. And I have not done any... Uh, public speaking of any substance since then. So now, speaking my story is a big coming out for me, and a big it's a, it's a big process. And I'm hoping that it will be a kind of healing and corrective experience for me. But beyond that, I'm hoping to communicate to others um, what my experience was like that they can empathize with. And as I said, I do have information in there about digital hearing aids and all the other different devices and things that can make life so much easier for somebody dealing with hearing loss now. I will be speaking at some of the local chapters of the Hearing Loss Association of America and giving giving them information. But I think my audience is really the general public who I think will be interested in the in the story and as I said, who may be struggling with mild age-related related hearing loss that can really benefit from some of the information in the book. What, what would you say you'd like your readers, uh, and you may have already defined this, we've talked about, uh, I'm asking the question in maybe just a slightly different way, so I would love to know what you would like your readers to take away from the book and the audiobook. What would you, what kind of, what impact are you intending to have with it? Again, I'm hoping that they get information about the incredible changes in technology that have happened over the course of my life. I think so many people take digital hearing aids so for granted. That's what's available right now. They have no idea uh, what a big game changer that was. And the different ways that digital hearing aids can be programmed that can be really helpful to them. Uh, So, yes, that's something that I'm hoping that people will learn. And then I'm hoping that it's also an interesting, entertaining read and offers an insight glimpse into what it's really like to live with a severe hearing loss and, you know, some of the big impacts that that has on a life. So I was uh, had the great pleasure of being the narrator for your audiobook, 
So let's share a bit about the process, our audiobook process. And uh, one of the things was about getting just the right amount of German accent for your parents' voices. Would you like to share how you provided information, uh, like audio, you know, sampling that would be helpful? Well, first, I just want to say it was kind of fun to land on you as my narrator. Because I listened to, I don't know, 12, 15 different, different things and then narrowed it down to two or three. And then I had my husband and, and daughter weigh in and we quickly got down to you. I forget you had a different name that you listed it under. So I didn't know it was you. So when I told uh, your team that I had selected you, we all had to have a kind of good laugh that, yes, you were the <laughs> owner of Pro Audio Voices and I ended up choosing you. And yeah, I think that was partly because I felt your voice represented me as best as possible. I know that that was a big decision for me, whether to narrate my own book versus go with an audio narrator. I knew I did not have the voice skills and you know, I would have needed real vocal coaching to do that. The German accent was the, probably the most challenging part because nobody can really get my my parents and and it, it was also a long time ago and my parents were pretty fluent actually in english so they did have a german accent but wasn't a super strong one right so i i think i know we went back and forth a couple of times of just dialing back the accent so that it wasn't too strong yeah and you provided uh you had some audio from your mother Right? Yes, uh, from that's the Holocaust right. Museum. Um, yes. It's the Holocaust oral history thing. And I don't know if you listened to that at all. I did, yes. Did, mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So that, that was probably helpful. It yeah. was. It was a great resource. Yeah. Yeah. The, I, so the, my recording name is Becky Parker, which is my maiden name and the name I always used for performance. So I just kept that throughout my more than one marriage <laughs> as my, <laughs> my performance name. Yeah. And uh, so I would love to know, well, a couple things. So one is if there was anything about the process of the production of the audiobook that stands out to you or was surprising to you in any way. And if you have any questions for me as your narrator. Well, I you know, this is, was a totally new experience for me doing a, doing an audiobook and I really had no idea what the process would be like. I think what was maybe surprising but also kind of fun was having to listen to the whole thing but how easy it was to follow the script and and the audio at the same time and then to stop and make corrections in the comment field you know that that was all very seamless i thought oh my god new technology i can't figure this out and it was it was really very very easy and and it, you know that worked well. and i know you and i had a couple of back and forth on a on a few things but not not much and you really got what i was trying to communicate to you about dialing back a little bit um in a few cases um, yeah. yeah yeah and it is an odd uh, process to have somebody else be my voice you know so that that took a little getting used to right uh, yeah. yeah i know that's always a, a little jarring at first for authors hearing them because it's written in the first person it's you know it's your life um so i understand that that can that can be a little jarring at first but um yeah i'm glad it all worked out well yes and how can listeners learn more about you and your writing and your speaking engagements that are coming up and things like that well the best way they can uh, learn about me is to go to my author website which is www.claudiamarstainauthor.com. And then on that, there's a media and events tab where they can go through and scroll down to the events and it will list the various events that are available in the Bay Area where I, where I will be speaking. And then, you know, there's descriptions of the book on that and how to order. They can order both the audio book and the print book on that. There's some blog posts and writings that I have on that website. So that's probably the best place to go. Great, great. And the audiobook at the time 
that we're recording right now, it's in pre-order, but by the time this uh, podcast launches, it will be fully available at amplifyaudiobooks.com. So we hope that you'll, our listeners will go and get their copy of But You Look So Normal by Claudia Marseille. Claudia, thank you so much for joining me today. Thank you so much for having me. It was a lot of fun. Thanks for joining us for Audiobook Connection, behind the scenes with the creative teams. Please take a moment to subscribe at audiobookconnection.com. The podcast is sponsored by Pro Audio Voices, helping great stories come alive through audiobook production and marketing. Learn more at proaudiovoices.com. Again, thanks for being with us and please join us next week. This podcast is a part of the C-Suite Radio Network. For more top business podcasts, visit c-suiteradio.com.